Unpacking Mormonism is a subsidiary of Daisy Girl Communications, LLC. All content herein is intended for educational purposes only and does not replace the advice or counsel of your personal care provider. So Mace, how are you feeling since we purposefully, we purposefully skipped our planning meeting because you started talking all brilliant and shit? Um, I have a five letter word for you, anxious. Anxious. Welcome back to That's Unpacking seven. Mormonism <laughs> and Other Religious Trauma. I am your very intelligent host, Sarah Westbrook, mm. joined today by my husband who cannot count the letters in the word anxious. <laughs> but can put you to sleep for surgery and wake you up without killing you. So we'll let you decide on who's intelligent and in what way. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. I have no idea what to do with that. Um, it was a joke. Um, I do know how many letters are in anxious. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I thought it was really funny, though, but I wasn't going to laugh to like, I don't know. What is that? Like comedic. Delivery or com whatever, anyway. <laughs> so I'm going to start you out with a story. Oh, shit. When we, first started <laughs> <laughs> when we first started doing this podcast, we were just kind of getting you know our feet underneath us, and so we would sit and we'd plan for a little while, and a couple of times we would kind of talk out our thoughts, and then when we actually recorded, it wasn't quite as good because the, the naturalness of it, the energy, the discovery, the energy mm -hmm. of it wasn't there. So we learned quickly that we're not going to do that anymore. And so we would just, we do planning meetings to just kind of make sure that we were both on the same page about where we wanted to go. What well, was the and, idea? And squirrel, our producer told us we should record our planning meetings, but it takes like an hour and a half to upload that stuff when I <laughs> do that. And I don't have that kind of time. So I was like, Great advice. An hour and a half might be Not an exaggeration. No, 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 no. The one time that, because it ended up being like three and a half hours of content and to get it to load, upload oh, yeah. into the, so that, because we, we separate them out. We do planning meetings separate than the other, than right. the actual podcast. It took four freaking anyway. ever to upload that into the Dropbox so that our producer could download it and, and edit it and right. do whatever. It right. was, it was nuts. So anyway, the point of the story was... We were getting ready to start doing our planning, and tonight is the fifth um, spot in our cult series um, where we're going to talk about overt behavioral control. And Sarah asked me, basically, where do you want to start? <laughs> and I don't know. I still don't know the answer to that question, but I was thinking about what the question that came to mind for me is, when you look at behavioral control, what is the most important way in which that is accomplished. Now, that's a judgment. So when I say most important, I'm, I'm really talking about myself because I'm the only one that I understand um, what that most important piece would be, at least right now. Sometimes that changes. But right, what so came you're to talking mind, about Mason Westbrook's theory. Yeah, yeah. Great. I'm talking about, and, and I imagine I'm not alone in thinking these things, but I'm also certain, just as certain, that there's other people who agree, who would think that other things are more important. But the first thing that came to mind, how does a religious organization maintain so very much control almost to the point of becoming a cult or certainly having cult-like tendencies, how do they maintain that much control? And the thought didn't occur to me at the time, but it's occurring to me now. And um, even Luna <clears throat> quotes this in her book. In their the, book? In their book, sorry. The, the very famous quote of someone coming to Joseph Smith and asking him, how do you govern so many people? And he very famously said, I teach them correct principles and they govern themselves. Mm -hmm. And it seems like a very, very cool idea. If you can just teach people, this is how you need to live and then let them live. It seems like a very cool thing. But what it, I see 
I see from a different perspective now, it's also a very subtle way to control people because you've taught them. And, and specifically now we're talking about, there's a section in, in the book, in Luna's book that is entitled wages of sin and miracles of forgiveness. That was the first thing that came to my mind is that if you can get them to believe that every choice matters, you own them. I think that's an interesting theory. The, I'm not saying you're wrong. I did, honestly, this is okay, guys. We didn't do a planning meeting, so I haven't worked out my thoughts. Right. That's we're, the first time I heard that as well as you. But one of the things that, you know, when you say, so what's the way that, you know, we gain control, behavioral thought control, emotion control, you know, all of information control, how do they do that? And for me, I think the sentence is that really sums it up best. So this is Sarah's theory is that they instill fear of some negative consequence that isn't tangible. It's not something that I can hang on to. So things like God won't love you as much, or you're going to be, you know, displeasing to a God, or you won't be worthy to keep your family forever. And so not only or whatever bad happens, That's going to be because of your behavior related to God or Satan or whatever. Right. So for me, the one sentence is instilling fear of the unseen future outcomes of, of your life. Like there's no way to prove that wearing too short of shorts is going to make, you know, me not worthy to be in God's presence because too much of my thighs were showing. Um, and then I think that that is over and over reinforced by the community that is also being controlled because now as I'm doing, you know, quote unquote things that makes me an apostate or, or makes me not as righteous or outside of the lines of their rules. Now I have the community and social pressures that if I'm going to fit in and feel like I belong, I have to conform to the group's rules. And we see this in humanity across all kinds of things. You know, the book Sapiens talks about, you know, how you stay in your tribe and what happens to, to the people that are on the outside of the tribe. So this is a very common human tendency, but I think one of the ways that cults gain control is they enmesh you in a group so that like, you know, Joseph Smith did not have to micromanage his members to get them to believe in what he was saying as a whole truth. I mean, even today, if we start talking anything negative about Joseph Smith, your TBM Mormons are going to get their panties in a twist. There's going to be some resistance there because we cannot question this person, but the pressure isn't coming from Joseph Smith. The pressure is coming from the group. It's a type of milieu control is what it's called in the cult research. And that is because my group, the the larger group of which I'm a part of is going to place judgment offer unsolicited advice. Um, you know, it's the bishops that are upholding the punishment for if you have a quote unquote serious sin. So, you know, things like you're expected to confess to the bishop, or at least you were when we were growing up, confess to the bishop if you were masturbating or, you know, even today, if you're looking at pornography, you're supposed to go to your bishop and say, Hey, I look at pornography And he is supposed to extend some type of punishment that almost always isolates you or others you from the group. And humans need their, their community, their group. I mean, Brene Brown talks about the importance of belonging and that's how they gain control is they make what I put down, you know, in my little thing at the end of last week. Okay. We're going to talk about overt behavioral control. And I was like, okay, so what are some examples? And one of the things that I wrote down was arbitrary rules and regulations that don't really have any significant value 
outside of the group. Yeah, well, and I think that a, I think that a lot of Mormons would argue that the rules aren't arbitrary. They're pretty straightforward. And, and in some ways that's true. But if you look at the consequences for breaking the rules, that's very arbitrary. It's almost like the... If it, it, we're talking about cults, right? So one of the things that oftentimes gets related to cults, even Luna does it, is uh, an abusive relationship, right? Um, the idea that you're in a situation that is keeping you tied down or abusive. One of the things that I think about that we talked about a while Wait, back. Wait, hang on. Tied down and abusive or tied down and abused? Um, yes. So Yes, to both. Both yeah. tied down perpetrating abuse and being a victim of abuse? Uh, no, I'm thinking more of so the victimization of people in an abusive relationship. Got it. So Keep I'm going. Thinking Sorry. more of like the children that are getting abused or the spouse that is getting abused. Okay, got it. Um, if you are in a relationship where you know if dad comes home angry, he's going to respond in such, a, such, such and such a way. But he's consistent in that. If he comes home and he's angry, he's going to respond this way. If he comes home and he's happy, he's going to respond in a different way. But he's very consistent. It still can be traumatizing. It's still an abusive relationship, but not quite as difficult or arbitrary. Whereas if you, if you don't know how dad is going to respond, he can come home happy. And in a flip of a switch, he's angry. And now he's doing stuff that you maybe have never even seen him do before or, or her or whoever the abuser is. Um, it becomes very unpredictable and somewhat in, in the way that you're describing the way I think I understand what you're saying, arbitrary in that his consequences as this abusive person are arbitrary. You don't know what he's going to do. So does that make sense? What I'm saying? Yeah, it does. And I, and I, in some ways agree and in some ways disagree. And so of course, as you're talking, I'm like, you know what, let's just get out the actual definition of arbitrary. Um, because, well, and before I share, cause I've got it right here on my phone. Right. Um, but before I share the definition and kind of go a little di- bit deeper into this, you know, you say the rule isn't arbitrary because it's predictable or if it's unpredictable and, and that, that kind of confuses me a little bit. I'm not sure my thing where I'm like these arbitrary rules within the cult organization that are only meaningful in the cult organization would be something along the lines of not being able or allowed to drink tea and coffee. So how is this an arbitrary rule? Well, if I look at the definition here for arbitrary, the third one under a mathematical reason is of unspecified value. Now, of course, using, utilizing a mathematical, um, definition for something that's not mathematical it it, you know can fall apart really quickly but the you know as an adjective it says based on random choice or personal whim rather than any reason or system so you know just making up rules for whatever reason um and then the other one is a power or a ruling body unrestrained and autocratic in the use of authority And so for me, I kind of still feel like the mathematical definition fits most with what I was referring to. Yeah, I think so. In the sense of it's not really explained in Mormonism why you're not supposed to drink tea or coffee. Now, there's a ton of speculation, like it's an addictive substance. It's because they use tannic acid. But if you look at the history of when the rule was put in place, they don't say tea and coffee, they say hot drinks. And in that time period, it was thought that drinking hot liquid was bad for your digestive system. And so they, you know what, excuse me, what I understand is that when Joseph Smith made this recommendation, it was don't drink hot shit because it's going to upset your stomach. And then right, it when, seems period driven, right? Period yeah. driven. And now that it can't be period driven, we need further revelation. And so they come up with tea and coffee and, you know, in the, in the medical research and nutrition research, we found that tea can be incredibly healthy and good for you. Um, coffee can be very good for you, you know, depending on how it's 
prepared and right. what system, right. you know, how synthetic it is or what chemicals are in you, blah, 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 blah. But honestly, drinking those in moderation might even have some significant health benefits. And so for me, I'm talking about arbitrary rules like, you know, way back when it was immodest to show your elbows, your wrists, your ankles, your neckline, you've got, right. I actually saw on Facebook, I think it was yesterday or this morning, some FLDS guy, like basically on a dating website asking for somebody with FLDS standards. He didn't and like literally in there said, I don't want to date somebody who's comfortable showing their ankles. And I was like, Oh, my pornographic ankles. I mean, like for me, it was kind of funny. Some pretty good looking ankles. Well, and for the record, he said, ladies, plural. <laughs> so, you know, some, some concern. It makes you like my ankles. <laughs> you know beautiful. what? If you only see my ankle, you can't see my tattoo another arbitrary rule of well let me let me take that just uh if i can a little bit further so you're talking about this arbitrary rule in this case of coffee and tea what did the organization so this is this is something that you've said it basically only has value in that particular religion like no other religion or 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 very few other religions or cults or cult organization right they it, it has valuable it has a great amount of value to mormons but little to no value to anyone else. Okay, um, I'm going to interrupt you because I got a squirrel. And then you can keep going. So, like, let me make a comparison with another cult. Okay. The Nexium cult utilized a sash system. So, depending on what color your sash was in the female ranks was a determinant of how high up in the ranks you were. And so, suddenly, these sashes these scarfs in certain colors suddenly became a very valuable thing that had significant meaning but if that nexium person was wearing that sash let's say at you know the local walmart here in osage beach missouri most people are not going to have any they idea don't care about the scarf at all what that significance right is you know s- same thing with like your boy scout ranks Not saying Boy Scouts is a cult, but once again, those, you know, we've got these tiger, bear, wolf, you know, ranks. They really don't mean anything unless you are inside the scouting thing. And so you can see these like tokens or symbols that are somewhat arbitrary in lots of organizations that are not cults. But when we start to say there is significant spiritual punishment or consequences if you don't follow these arbitrary rules, like, you know, if I'm like a Nexium and I'm like, hey, if you don't have an orange sash, you're going to hell and you'll never be able to see your family in heaven again. Okay, now we've got a problem. Right. Well, and that's kind of where I was going to as well is just the when you the word of wisdom was given as a revelation in 1833 we know historically that it was not any kind of commandment it says in the in the revelation this is not a commandment simply sharing with you the will of the lord well it's kind of interesting because you're taking something and saying it's not a commandment but the will of the lord for the temporal salvation of his people for me those are kind of Synonymous. That's kind, no, they're kind of an oxymoron, right? You can't say oh, it's I not a commandment, saying. but it is the will of the Lord. That's that's kind of interesting, but I think it was a setup because what happened was you gave you gave this commandment, and it can almost be like a privilege or a show of your righteousness while I'm living this law because the Lord recommended that we do. But somewhere down the road, it's almost like the leadership says, you know what? this commandment really isn't having the kind of effect that we want on people. Here's what we do. Let's make it a commandment now. And a few years down the road, we'll make it mandatory for you to live this law to go to the temple. Mm -hmm. Then this suggestion that was given has now become a hard and fast rule that affects your eternal salvation. And that's kind of that pathway of that, that cult mindset. We'll throw it out there. And then eventually it will become something way more important than it will ever seem to have been intended for. Sure. Maybe, you know, I don't, I don't have any data to say yes or no. One of the things though, that makes me laugh about this is Joseph Smith, a prophet of God did not obey 
this word of wisdom that he supposedly got directly from God's mouth. Like right. he still drank, he still smoked cigars, he still chewed tobacco. I, he still did all those things. But Joseph Smith was well known for not following his own rules, which by the way, ha ha ha, that is a sign of a cult. When you have these very strict set of rules for everybody else to follow, but the leader doesn't have to follow them. That's a sign of a toxic system. Unquestionable authority. Time for a commercial break. We'll be right back. Right, you're not able to ask, well, why doesn't Joseph Smith follow his own rules? Or why didn't he follow his own rules? Or why didn't he? Or even, even now today, why don't they? Why are they expecting me to be, you know, one of the Temple Recommend questions is, are you, do you strive to be honest in your dealings with your fellow men? But the last big couple of big things that have come out, particularly like the SEC fine, demonstrate that the leadership was not honest in their dealings with these, in these financial dealings. Right. So it's kind of this double standard of, you know, but we can't question them. We can't ask them. The statement that they made was like, we paid the fine. This is over. This is a closed deal. We're not talking about it anymore. Right. Well, and that's again, another overt, um, example of behavior control in the sense of you have somebody who is supposedly speaking on God's behalf saying it is wrong to question or criticize your leaders. Well, it's okay to question them as long as you accept the answer that's very circular reasoning, which we're going to get to as we get more into the right. internal, you know, the thought control. Um, almost and, some kind of, the, almost kind of the tools that are used to... Right, to, yeah, to get that, you to know, you in brain and keep manipulation, you in. Yep. right, which is the circular reasoning of all answers lead back right. to the Mormon church being true. So, you know... For example, if you read the Book of Mormon and you pray about it and you don't get that burning in your bosom and this like, yes, this is true. Well, then you didn't do it with enough faith or you didn't pray hard enough or, you know, just go ahead and accept that it's true. And eventually right. that will come because anything that you, any experience that you have that says the Book of Mormon isn't true means Satan is in control right. of your life. Right. There's no allowance for the fact that somebody else could get a different answer. It's not right. possible that the Book of Mormon isn't true. So you must have done something wrong. Right. In your prayers, or you just must not, must not be ready for it or whatever. Right. So I had a thought. I was going to read just a couple of paragraphs here from this Wages of Wages of Sin and Miracles of Forgiveness. And then I'd like to tell the story of what I did over the last few days. What book are you reading from? Luna's book, Recovering Agency. Oh, Recovering Agency. Um, okay, so once again, we want to you know throw this out there. We really recommend our listeners buy Luna Lindsay Corbden's book, Recovering Agency. Uh, it's what, Mason, what's the subtitle? Unveiling or Lifting the Veil of lifting Mormon veil. Yep. Mind Control. What page are you reading from? I'm on page 132. One, and three, are two. you quoting a secondary, like, so Luna's no. book would be the secondary source? No, um, this is uh, Luna's words here. All right, and you said 132? 132. It's yeah, under I'm the gonna... subtitle, Wages of Sin and Miracles of Forgiveness. Got it. The church employs many emotional setups to create self-fulfilling prophecies. What? I recall I recall a tearful fireside where a former apostate had returned after sowing her wild oats. She spoke of her sinful years and how unfulfilling they were and how guilty and miserable she felt. That means it's time for Mason to pull the chicken out of the... <laughs> <laughs> that is what it means. Or the steak out of the fridge. She spoke and... of her sinful years and how unfulfilling they were and how guilty and miserable she felt until she finally repented and found relief. If you are told repeatedly by everyone you trust that shame comes from doing a certain thing, then you will feel shame in doing that thing. It doesn't matter what that thing is. You can be programmed to feel shame or guilt for killing insects, for not saying thank you or for failing to sacrifice a goat. If the church gives you a list of sins and claims they will make you feel horrible, then you will probably feel horrible if you do those things. You will come to view your guilt as proof that the church was right all along. You are also told you can't feel the spirit if you're unworthy. Naturally, feelings of shame and worry will prevent anyone from feeling serenity and peace. That is the effect of the prediction itself. Well, and so, yeah, I love that. And we're going to really dig into that a lot when we get more into the mind 
control, the thought mm-hmm. control side of things. But I want to just point out the relevance of Luna's statement in this case. So I was actually talking about this with a client just recently. So if I, Mason, if I gave um, our daughter, Katie, so Katie is 14, almost 15. If I gave her a kebab stick with roasted beetles on it to eat for dinner, what would her response be? (laughs) It would be everything that you can imagine from a typical stereotypical girl. With a little extra flair for the drama. That girl definitely <laughs> got some drama flair. Well, and not like... She an got I'm... some... She inherited some drama from her mama. <laughs> right. And it wouldn't be like an I'm scared of the Beatles kind of a thing. It would just be that is so incredibly disgusting that I can't even believe you're even talking about the possibility of this. Right. Yeah. Now, let's say that we had raised that that we were from a different culture, Asian or African cultures, because there's lots of those cultures, um, that... That is part of their regular cuisine. cuisine. Now I give them the exact same stick of bugs on a stick, kebab stick, roasted and flavored in the exact right way. What is my kid's most likely response going to be? Yum. Yum. And they're going to eat it. And we're going to have a normal, a normal night of sticky rice and bugs. It's not going to be anything significant. No one will even remember the night later. Right. Yep. And so this is a great example of a lot of our tastes and belief systems are positioned around the societies and the groups that we were, you know, brought up in. This is why you see evolutions of belief systems and value systems over time. Um, One of the greatest tools that people have in maintaining prejudices is not talking about the issue that's right in front of you. Like I have a sister-in-law who's right now we're in a friendly and very respectful debate um, about talking to your children about LGBT lifestyles and relationships. Right. And sister-in-law's belief is kids shouldn't be thinking about it at all, ever. Don't bring it up. Let right. kids be kids. Right. And I'm of the mindset of if a kid brings it up, we talk about it. I don't care how old you are. We talk about it. You know, one of the greatest preventatives for, you know, sexual assault is giving the victim the voice. You know, you're you're going to see. So that way, you know, if, if they get in uncomfortable situations, they're like, hey, this makes me uncomfortable. I know I'm allowed to have a voice and I know that my voice is going to be heard. They have a better, easier time of getting away. And if they don't, if they're for whatever reason, unable to get away, if you've talked about it, they're more likely to report. Right. Okay. So, so talking about things and making certain things normal, a normal part of life. Like if we look at history Lesbians, gays, bisexual, transgender, transsexual. It's, it has been a part of mammalian society for as far back as we have record of it. So subsequently, the other piece of this is that, you know, when Mason and I first started our family, we lived in a primarily white community. And as we traveled the world, well, not the world, the United States, um, as part of a military family and as our children grew up around different ethnicities and religious belief styles and, and religious or religious belief styles, haha, re- different religions and different values and belief styles, our children subsequently naturally overcame prejudice because it wasn't there for them in the same way from the time they were little as it was for me right. growing up in a, in a white community. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm thinking if, if you're ready, let's switch gears and yeah. I, okay. I just kind of want to go to, so I had an experience that I did a, a few days ago. I was sitting in the hospital for a few hours with my daughter who gets an infusion every month. And so I was with her and I pulled out this bite model paperwork 
that has the four different categories, behavioral, informational, thought, and emotional control. And just on my notes page on my phone, I just started writing down numbers. I went behavior, behavioral control number one, and then just wrote down what's an example from Mormonism, because of, that's that's my area. That's the, that's the area I know. So it wasn't right. cults in general so much as wh- how, do, how does this particular thing, what are some examples of this particular thing? Can well, I can I ask you a question though? Like no, before, no questions allowed. Ah, uh, whatever. Um, before, <laughs> before. I don't know why you ask if you can ask a question. If when I, I say no, you just ask anyway. Yes, good point. So Sounds anyway, very cult like. It is very cult like. So anyway, <laughs> oh my god. No, so before we started this series, did you feel that Mormonism fit into the definition of a cult? Um, so like, are you fitting these things together because you're like, yeah, I'm not even convinced that it fits or what's, what's going on there? I don't know. I don't know if I'd made the determination as to whether or not I feel like Mormonism is an occult. I had made the determination that lots of things or ways that the, that the Mormon church operates are very cult like, and therefore whether or not the cult, not a cult, it was worth pursuing because I feel like most of, the, if not all of these things that Dr. Hassan calls cult-like things are an unhealthy way to go about manipulating or controlling people. Okay. And so whether or not I'd made the decision, I don't think that I had. I don't think that I would have called a Mormon church, the Mormon church a cult at the time. Um, so a lot of it was just kind of my own research. I knew that getting into this, it was your idea. And I thought that it was a very good idea simply because we can talk a lot about a, a lot about unhealthy ways that organizations or people operate, because ultimately what we're trying to do is help people to operate in healthy ways. So if you right. can look at some of the bad things or the unhealthy ways that things happen, then you can avoid those um opera opera modus operandi kind of a thing you can avoid those things <laughs> somebody else is stumbling in the future. over his words yeah um so i want to i want to say two things number one if any of your family members are listening to this they're going to start saying you can't think for yourself because i say the mormon church is a cult and by the end of this you're probably going to be feeling that same way so this is mason not thinking for himself y'all just in case you're wondering But no, number two, on a more serious note, um, and less snarky and sassy, um, I'm in a kind of a snarky, sassy mood today. Um, Sounds about normal. Hey, um, (laughs) that's not true. Um, All right. So anyway. Gonna get myself in trouble. Yes, you are. Number (laughs) two, I want to remind our listeners that anytime we're looking at diagnostics, um, and, and I think this is true for any field, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but just because there's one or two items that fit into the category does not a diagnosis make. Correct. Um, so like in my field, I hear all the time, like right now, narcissism is a, is a huge buzzword and suddenly I have all kinds of clients coming in with, you know, my spouse is narcissistic. Right. And when I actually go through the DSM, which is the Diagnostical and Statistical Manual for Mental Health Disorders, um, really what I'm looking at is, hey, you know, maybe your spouse is utilizing this behavior of gaslighting, but it's not due to an underlying narcissistic personality disorder Um, rather than it's you know, an unhealthy coping mechanism that needs to be addressed within the relationship. Um, And so, you know, so same things like one of the first signs of colon cancer is, you know, what pain and bleeding while you poop or having blood in your stool. right. Right. Well, that's also two of the most common symptoms of constipation as well. Sure. And so as we're, you know, looking at this, is the Mormon church a cult or is the Mormon church not a cult? It's very subjective. 
Yes. But when you start listing it the way that you did, which I definitely want you to, you know, share a lot of that. My point being, Mason, is that as you go through this list, it's normal for there to be varying opinions about the significance of the items that you are listing. Sure. And oftentimes the reason there's going to be such variation is because, you know, maybe the idea that um, not drinking any alcohol. So we'll say the Mormon church has a rule, the health code of complete, complete abstination. Is that even a word of alcohol, complete abstinence of alcohol and because of their familial history of having a parent or an uncle or an aunt or, you know, somebody close in their life that struggled with alcoholism, that control over it may not feel as unhealthy to them as it would to somebody else who has a family history of appropriate alcohol use, you know, social drinking and You know, there's never been abuse or neglect tied in with the behavior. So you're going to see a lot of people with varying degrees. And, you know, one of the things that makes me laugh is that, you know, I kind of chuckle about it is that when I talk about the Mormon church being a cult like system or a cult or that they are a cult, I get a lot of people saying, well, by your definition, then all religions are cults. And really what I want to say is, no, I disagree with that, but I would agree with the statement most religions and most systems have some unhealthy cult-like behaviors involved. And so Mason, as you go through your list, I want our listeners to be able to kind of take in and absorb the um, plethora, there's a good word for it, the plethora of examples that you are giving. Because when you start to look at how many different aspects of Mormonism fit in, and this is just Mason Westbrook's looking at it. This isn't, you know, Stephen Hassan's look, Stephen Hassan looking at it, or Luna Lindsay Corbden looking at it, who, you know, they've studied this for years and years. This is Mason Westbrook's notes over the last day or so that there's a great deal of significance. And that is why I think Mormonism fits the quote unquote diagnostic criteria, if there even is such a thing for the Mormon church being identified as a cult. So let's take a quick commercial break. Unpacking Mormonism, we'll be right back. Sure, for me, the answer doesn't really matter very much. You asked, would I have considered them a cult before I did this research on cults? The answer is probably not. Um, Now that I've done a lot of this research and we've done a lot of the talking, would I consider them a cult? I'm not sure. I'm still um, kind of up in the air on that one, but I still agree that so much of what they do to influence and I say control, they might use a different word, but to control people Mm -hmm. is unhealthy. And I think that if an organization like this that does do a lot of good and certainly has a capacity to do a lot of good, if they could take a look at themselves and recognize, you know what, that is kind of an icky way to do things. How could we do that differently so that we're not controlling people? We're just helping them to see how their behavior can affect their own lives or whatever, blah, blah, blah. If they do some healthy reflection as an organization, you could dump a lot of this stuff that you're doing and, and end up in a different situation. So for me, the, the title doesn't matter that much, but the material matters a lot. Right. So for you, labels are not as significant as the experiences that come from the toxic behavior. But I don't think that they ever are, but sometimes they're far more helpful than other times. You talked about medical diagnoses, right? If you come into the hospital and some and every doctor knows that you have renal failure, they're going to treat you differently than if they every time you come in you say, I can't pee very good. <laughs> Those are 
completely vastly different things. One is a part of the other, but the other one is so much further beyond than I can't pee very well. Right. So it, the label can be very helpful. And uh, in this case, some people are going to feel very comfortable calling Mormonism a cult. And if that works for them to help deal with whatever is going on in their minds, I think that that's fine. The fact that so many Mormons become so uncomfortable with the idea of being called a cult just for me speaks to the fact that they don't have the ability to look at themselves and their organization introspectively. Yeah, I would agree with that. So what I did, what's your list? So what I did, and, and I'm willing to just go through a little bit of this and we can talk about some of it, or we can go through a whole bunch of them. So stop me if something comes up, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start here in behavioral control. This is the first section. Right. I'm not very good at stopping you, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I know. You just <laughs> always let me it. ramble on. Yeah. So, um, the very first thing that comes up, his first, his number one is regulate individuals, physical reality. Now I'm kind of. I'm kind of eh, whatever on that. But the example I came up with is that no outside sources in a lot of ways. And I think this could mean a lot of different things for people. For me, the idea that you cannot have outside resources that are of value in the organization, that feels like you're influencing my physical reality. Right. I think to your physical reality are things like, you know, when they are encouraged to say, I know the church is true, but it's based on a feeling, but somehow we're placing, you know, your feelings above logic, critical thinking in fact can do that. The idea that we're going to alter your physical reality for things like a marriage doesn't really count in the next life unless it's done in our way. A baptism doesn't count unless it's done in our way. And why I would say that those things alter somebody's physical reality is because, you know, if if you get baptized and that has spiritual significance to you and you feel more connected with your higher power because of that baptism, well, then that is a part of your reality. And Mormonism would say, it doesn't matter that that great thing has occurred for you. Your baptism doesn't count and God doesn't recognize it because it wasn't done inside right. our organization. So it would be examples like that about altering your reality. Yeah, makes sense. So number two is dictate where, how, and with whom the member lives and associates or isolates. So my initial thought initially was just other members, tight-knit groups, it doesn't take very long, very much research for you to recognize that the general idea is we don't associate with people outside of Mormonism unless our objective is to become friends with them, to be able to offer the gospel to them. Right. We don't and just become friends just because not from a leadership perspective, right. not that there's any teaching. I don't think there's any teaching that you can't become friends with your neighbors, but when they do talk about becoming friendship friend with neighbors, it's almost always connected with sharing the gospel. And I would say that that one's definitely going to vary based on where you live because in, oh, sure. like in Utah, in Utah, you can live that way. Right. In Missouri, you can't live that way. Well, it depends on where in Missouri. If you're up in the Independence area, oh, yes, you can. Maybe, but, yeah. Yeah, so there is there is some isolation going on. But I would say that that one comes down to things like telling you who you should or should not marry. You should marry a member. You should marry a returned missionary. Well, that kind of comes into the next one, okay, too. So ahead. the next one is when, how, and with whom the member has sex. Obviously, if you look at doctrine, you have sex only with the person that you're married with, and that's it. Well, and, and you've got the when and the how, so back in the day, it was missionary style is the only appropriate right. and manner. I don't, I don't that think came that out was, of Spencer W. Kimball's stuff. Right. I don't think that was ever considered doctrine, but if somebody like Spencer W. Kimball, who is or became the prophet, right, the president the of prophet. the church, mm -hmm. is saying things like missionary style is the only approved, quote unquote, style of sex, people are going to take that seriously. And, you know, it, it may kind of go the way of the wind when he's not the prophet anymore, but at the time... People are going to take that seriously. Right. And I think really the point is here is that the church is infiltrating the intimacy going on in the privacy of your own yes. home outside of just saying it needs to be consensual and it needs to do no harm. Right. Well, and, and the point being that if it's not a cultish thing, if it's not about control, 
then as an organization, you set up some healthy boundaries that say something just like you said, it needs to be consensual. And we believe it needs to be within the bounds of marriage. I don't have any issues with you saying something like that, but I'm not going to control what you do. Well, and I don't have to have a conversation about toys or pornography in your marriage or anything like that, because that's not my business. Right. But your issue here is not necessarily just the rules. It's the punishment that comes if you don't obey the rules. So now it's, if you're looking at pornography, the church has a responsibility. You know, your bishop, if you go tell him, your bishop has a responsibility to A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And, you know, that isolates you from your community, but it's also a very unhealthy power control dynamic. Right. It also doesn't give you the opportunity to even talk about it. Like, I don't know couples in Mormonism that could sit down in a home and talk about intimacy and struggles that they're having or what have you done that works or doesn't work or how have you worked? I don't know people that could do that. They couldn't because it just seems so taboo to even well, talk about it with friends. And right. this, in this case, you're talking about members that are friends. So, well, I have to kind of laugh because one of my experiences on this topic is I had one couple come in because they were having some sexual dysfunction issues. And I've actually heard this more than once. Um, and the recommendation that they got from their Bishop was not to go get help from a professional. It was read the book of Mormon together and your sex life will get better. And I was like, (laughs) say what? (laughs) Maybe Uh, if you read songs of Solomon, maybe, but no. And that can move into the second one, information control. Right. right now, it's like not only are we uh, controlling what you get on a spiritual nature, but we're controlling what you get on uh, other issues as well. If you're having sexual issues, don't go talk to somebody who knows how to help you with sexual issues. Go to the Book of Mormon. God will tell you what you're supposed <laughs> to do. And I'm not saying that in, in Mormonism, you don't believe that God can communicate with you in that way. But the reality is we also believe he's not going to. There's other people out there that can talk to you about those issues. The Book of Mormon is not going to help you with sex. Well, so. most likely. Right. <laughs> right. So the if it next does, one, that's some kinky shit. Send me an email. I want right. to know about it. The next one is control types of clothing and hairstyles. I don't even know if we need to go into that. We have right. a huge modesty thing right. in the church. If you're not familiar with Mormonism, you have to wear clothing that covers the garment. The garment has changed changed multiple times, allowing for more skin exposure with each change. But the garment today for men is basically a high neck, like a crew neck t-shirt and um, Bermuda shorts that end just above the knee. For women, they're Bermuda shorts again and just above the knee. And then with like a cap sleeve thing and a a neckline that is not supposed to allow for any cleavage to show, but you know what? Us big girls, no matter what we put on, some well, cleavage it, is going to be through. And hair is the same way. Like it's not tightly regulated, but there's a cultural right, but it's expectation. Dis- right. It's highly discouraged to come to church with like rainbow hair. Right. You Although don't see people with dyed that. hair very often. I just said that. And then I remember that the yeah. week that our family did that, you were the bishop. We mm-hmm. got your hair. We turned it purple. Mm-hmm. Like you had purple yeah. hair and then like one of the kids had red, one had green, one had yellow. It was so fun. Because it's not doctrinal and most people in our ward thought it was fun, but you can, I can guarantee you that some of them thought that that was completely inappropriate yeah. because there's this cultural expectation. Well, or the simple thing is, you know, Mason, you absolutely love bright colors. Like if you guys were in the studio, you'd look at Mason's shirt and be like, yep, he likes bright <laughs> colors he always has and mason wears right mason wears a oh squirrel i've got a squirrel here in a minute mason (laughs) was wearing a purple suit to church regularly when he was called into the bishopric for the first time and it was made abundantly clear that since the 12 apostles and the prophet don't wear purple it's not appropriate for mason and the bishopric to wear a purple suit. So he had to go with like boring blue and stuff. But one of the things I was laughing about, I was talking to Aaron Toronto, who is a movie producer. He produced the movie, The Brilliant Darkness. It's a Vietnam, I'm sorry, Vietnamese 
movie. I believe it won the the Vietnam equivalent to the Oscars. I mean, it was a right. great, right. Best great picture. movie. Yeah, best picture and whatnot. So it's foreign film. I definitely highly recommend it, you guys. It's great. Uh, you can get it on, I believe I got it on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Um, so that I could watch it. And he and I are talking about possibly turning my book into like a Netflix or Hulu mini series. And so he read my book, he got an advanced reader's copy and he read it. And one of the things that made me laugh is in our first meeting, um, he said, yeah, I was, cause Mason, you went to high school with Aaron right. um, and you were in his ward. You guys were very close yep. friends growing up. And so I had to laugh hysterically because Aaron was like, yeah, I was reading your book and you talk about this guy walking into choir in bright yellow pants and, you know, a white t-shirt that's tucked in with a burgundy suit jacket. And he goes, oh, she's talking about Mason before I actually gave your name in the book. But again, that control over dress, Mormons not only talk about what you have to cover up, but they're going to talk about things like don't dress in any way that draws attention to you. So you need to dress kind of be muted in your clothing right. wherever you go, which, yeah, there's a lot of control sure. there. So if we're going to actually get through this list, you're going to have to let a couple of these go. Either that or it's going to take three hours to upload our episode again. Like I said, if we're going to get through All this right, list. keep going. I'll shush. <laughs> So the next one is regulate diet, food and drink, hunger and or fasting immediately for word of yep. wisdom, fasting rules. Yep. Um, six, manipulation and deprivation of sleep. I don't feel like there's anything specific about that. In fact, I put no on the list for deprivation of sleep. Um, other than just other than just being, being ta- just, over busy. Yes. Other than yeah. just being busy. I agree. But there's nothing specific about that. Yeah. Come on, Mason. Let's go. Hey, watch it. <laughs> Seven, financial exploitation, manipulation, or dependence. Ding, we ding, talked ding, a little ding, bit ding, ding. about this in the tithing episode. I don't really want to go into this too much, yep. but also just the way that the welfare system is managed um, can create a lot of dependence. So I think that the, that is there. Right. Pay us and then we'll take care of you. Right. If you pay us and then clean our toilets. Right. Keep going. Exactly. Um, eight, restrict leisure, entertainment, vacation time. I, I initially thought no, but then I was thinking movies, music, right. You're not other allowed concerning to listen, entertainment. Right. Expl- music with swear words in it is a no. Rated R movies is a no. Um, where you go, like, you know, burlesque shows would be a no. Right. Certain, you know, oh, how is their costume image? Those types of things. So they right. do, but it's more mild than a lot of others. Uh, but agreed. absolutely. Agreed. Yeah, keep going. And some of it... I think most of it wouldn't actually affect your status in the church, but it would be frowned upon. Well, it depends. Again, if you're in Utah and you're running into your, you know, bishop or something and they're like, oh, what movie are you seeing? And you're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to see that rated R movie, whatever. It could could, have an impact. It could have a social impact. Right. Right. It could. All right, so nine major no strip clubs. Okay, major going. time spent with group indoctrination and rituals and or self indoctrination, including the internet. Holy and shnikes. What yes, I wrote, Mormonism. <laughs> what I wrote, all spiritual education comes from church or church resources, and time is covertly controlled. Right. Um but you've you've kind of backed yourself into this corner. They don't see it as a corner, but everything that you're supposed to study and supposed to study on a regular basis comes from the church. Right. And it's scriptures, conference talks, scriptures, conference talks, firesides that are focused on conference talks, talks in church focused on conference right. talks, curriculum, right. a few scriptures focus on the conference talk over and over and over. Keep going. Yeah. So 10, permission required for major decisions. I can't go to the temple without talking to my bishop. So I put a no on this one, but I can see that there would be some examples that kind of fit into well, that. Like, I don't, need, I don't need to ask my bishop if I can get married. I do need to have my bishop's permission if I'm going to get married in the temple, but not for the marriage. So right, the place but, matters, but not the event itself. Let me put this in a little bit different though. So things like the Mormon church has these prescribed developmental milestones yes. that would be overt behavioral control. So things like blessing your baby, okay. you have to get the bishop's permission for when you're going to do it 
and where you're going to do it. So like yes. we wanted to bless one of our babies outside of our ward building because your grandfather had just passed away. And we were like, all of the family is here and the funeral is a few minutes away from my family. We could we're not. We're going to do it in the building. You couldn't yep. just do it. Right. You were not allowed to do it at my parents' house. We had to get permission in order True. for that to happen. Yep. Same with baptism. If you're not getting baptized in your ward building, you have to coordinate that between the two bishops to make sure the supervision is appropriate. Yep. Missions. You have to go through your bishop and your stake president and then the first presidency before you're allowed to serve a mission. And these prescribed milestones, all men are expected to serve a mission. That would be overt behavioral control. All young men are expected to give up two years of their lives to go on a mission. For women, it is encouraged but not mandatory because it's better for them to get married. You're going to see things right. like you're not allowed. So when COVID happened, we were not allowed to pass the sacrament in our own home without permission from the bishop. Right. Um, and then they gave kind of like a, a blanket. It's okay. But then there was a time where I was like, well, we don't know. You know, like how many times did we text the bishop and be like, hey, we're not coming. Can we do the sacrament in our home? And he was all, yeah, sure, whatever. So I disagree in the sense of, and, and again, members are going to see this differently. Like, well, we have to make sure you're worthy, but that's what makes it culty, right? Because it's none of your damn business if I'm worthy. And Mormonism is one of the only religions that requires you to be worthy to enter a place of worship, such as the temple. Yeah. Or to be baptized or, right, like or whatever. Converts. Yeah. You can't get baptized until you've gone through an interview. And if you have any big sins, you have to go ask permission from somebody before you can even get baptized. Yep. So yeah, there's a problem here. You got to have permission from somebody else, usually a man, almost always a man, actually, now that I say that, who quote unquote holds the priesthood. Yep. So yeah, there's a lot of authority control going on. Let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. Keep going. Absolutely. I, I, I love that. Thank you very much. 11 thoughts, feelings, and activities of self and others reported to superiors. And I would say that that goes back to what we talked about with, you know, it, the quote that you read out of the recovering agency book that the church tells you what is right or wrong and how you are supposed to feel like when you do sin, this is what it feels like yeah. when you're righteous, this is what it feels like. Um, it's not okay to think these things. If you've thought it in your mind, you've already committed the sin in your heart, those types of things. So check, keep going. Yeah. Well, and I put down that confession has a broad spectrum of use, temple recommend mm -hmm. questions, all of those things. Yeah. Um, number 12, rewards and punishments used to modify behaviors, both positive and negative. You talked a little bit about that. Um, church discipline is one of the things that I put down there. And then we talked earlier about the threats of eternal punishment. If that isn't manipulation, then I'm not sure what it is because there's no way for the church or any other organization to validate that what they're saying is in fact accurate. Right. And well, so it becomes and a, a manipulation. When I had my affair in 2004, I went through a disciplinary council, um, you know, and one of the things that was really interesting to me is that the bishop came back and said, because then you got deployed shortly after the affair and shortly after that confession. And the bishop came back to me and they said, you know, we prayed about it and we have felt that the Lord wants you to move home with your parents while your husband is on his deployment. So that way you don't cheat again. And number one, um, at that point, the affair was almost over. Um, actually that shoved me into <laughs> read my book. Um, but, um, one of the things was that was interesting is I knew immediately that didn't come from God because if that bishopric had known about the abuse that I had suffered in my home as a teen, there's no way they would have told me to go back 
right. to my childhood home. So when you talk about the disciplinary counsel and stuff, yes, they remove certain privileges. Yes, it can isolate you from your community. Yes, they claim they do it from love. But at the end of the day, the member that is being disciplined, if they're trying their best to stay in this community, are very open to suggestion from a bunch of people who really don't get all of the things going on behind the scenes that gives them authority and control in ways that are just not appropriate. They just aren't. Gratefully, my trauma response kicked in and I was like, well, hell no, I'm not going home. And Mason also gratefully, you were like, yeah, Sarah, you're not. You're not going back to your parents, not after this. This is not wise. Well, and, and ultimately, if you look at it from one, two different perspectives here, if you have a leadership that is used to being unquestioned, they come to you with unsolicited advice. They tell you what they think you ought to do, whether they couch it in the words the Lord said or I said. Right. They're coming to you with unrequested advice, unsolicited advice. When what needed to happen was that bishop needed to sit down with you and say, hey, I'm worried about you. You're right next to this person. You're having an affair. You're in this situation. Your husband is leaving. You are in a rough situation. Right. I, I want to know what is your plan? What do you think would be best? I have some ideas, but frankly, I don't know you well enough to know what would be best. Can right. we talk about it? Can I help you as you sort through some of these things? If that had happened, you could have easily said, you know, Bishop, I understand that going home to my parents probably seems like a good idea, but I suffered a lot of abuse in that home. And if I go home and the worst of it happened after I had sex with that person, Right. If I go home now, I'm going to get exactly what I got then. And now I have a son to take care of, too. I'm not Choose, doing that. W well, we were in the process of adopting Briggs. So right. we had, only one, had and one and a half sons. We right. had one and a half sons. <laughs> um, right. And, and all it takes is the point is all it takes is some conversation right. rather than unsolicited advice, because I'm your leader and I have a responsibility for you. Screw that. Right. Well, and the issue is, is that. Mormonism sets things up that makes the bishop the authority on my life and yes. my spiritual yes. direction. And that's really where the problem is, is that my bishop, I mean, he's a good man. I love that man. Despite everything we've been to together, th through together, I very much love that bishop. Um, for one, he came back and admitted making a huge mistake, which... You know, I was very grateful for on that. Right. But um, my point being was that he probably gave me unsolicited advice because he felt pressure to do so because that was his role. His yep. role was to say a prayer and ask God what is best for Sarah Westbrook at this time. And so it makes sense that he defaulted to, you know, <clears throat> most Mormon families are supposed to be happy. They're not. But they're supposed <laughs> to be, so let's send her back to her family. He had no he, he had no idea right. what I had been through. And asking him to get to know each person individually is, that intimately is unrealistic. Right. Well, because what it's your average happen. ward has what five, six hundred people on the roll, and then your how many members are active is gonna be what, around two hundred, right. maybe? Right. Okay. I'm a licensed professional counselor. I don't ever have a caseload over 32. I can't right. keep up. Right. And I do this. And you get paid almost, to do right, it. I get paid. It is your job. Right. And I've got yeah. training and every, yeah. I don't do more than 32 people on a case in, on my caseload because I can't. Right. right. I can't. Right. So we're asking something that is, is unrealistic. Inhumanely possible. Yeah. It's not. Not humanly possible. It's not inhuman. Well, it is inhumane as well, in my opinion, but it's not humanly possible. Keep right. going. Number 13, discourage individualism, encourage group think. Duh. What I wrote down is we have our own church lingo. It's the same everywhere you go. Same dress, quiet melding to the same individual. And what I mean by that, you actually posted something on Facebook. Maybe this is what you were asking about earlier. The angels looking down on the earth and <laughs> they were, they're all white they're men, I think, men. right? Yeah. Well, and it said, don't fornicate because the angels are watching you and they're all white men. And I'm like, ooh, angel porn. <laughs> 
But Oops. the idea that I'm going to hell, and everybody. The, the church is going. getting better at not saying this anymore, but I don't think they're actually getting better at not believing it. Is the right. idea that we're all going to be the same in heaven because we're all going to be like God and. Yeah, it's a messy idea, and and it's still very much alive in the church. Number fourteen. The in- comments, the the comments on that original post, because I shared it. But honestly, if you guys are on our Facebook page, you should click on the original post. There's something like fifteen thousand comments yeah. on it, or something. And I sat there and read through those comments and could not stop laughing. <laughs> they were hysterical. Hysterical. Nice. If you need a laugh, if you need to pick me up, head over to my business profile, Sarah Westbrook. Find me on Facebook. I've got my professional picture there and whatnot. But just go through that and find that meme. Click on it. Read the comments. You will not be disappointed. <laughs> it was phenomenal. It was hilarious. Angel porn. Angel so, porn. Number 14, <laughs> impose rigid rules and regulations. And what? I put on my response, I put, um, yep. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't even need to go into that. I feel like there's no need even to talk about it because it's so well defined by everything that we've talked about. 15, right. punish disobedience by beating, torture, burning, cutting, rape, or tattooing, branding. So on this one, I put No. I'm sure that there's some nuance to that idea, but if you look at it from face value, which is what I did, I don't feel like there's any punishment by beating, torture, burning, cutting, rape, or tattooing, branding. I don't think that there's anything like that. Where I would disagree is that the church um, supports, still believes is effective, and up until it was made illegal in the state of Utah recently paid for and advocated for conversion therapy for those in the LGBT population. And if we, by extension, include conversion therapy, then unfortunately, beating, shocking, waterboarding, those are things that occur in conversion therapy to de-gay somebody. Um, And so... Is it something that's readily taught or practiced? No. But if you go back into our history a little bit, there's some pretty shitty things that go on. Well, and that's a good point there because um, I hadn't really thought of those things. And so, yeah, I wouldn't expect those kind of things to be obvious for everyone. So thinking of the less obvious responses is very helpful. Um Number 16, threaten harm to family and friends. I it's thought, existential harm. I thought mostly of eternal things, right? Eternal separation. Um, do, but it does lead to a culture of earthly separation to protect from apostate ideas and wickedness. Right. Well, because I've been called an apostate, an apostate many times now because I'm speaking out um, about my experiences in Mormonism and whatnot. So... You know, in our here and now existence, there's a lot of social isolation that goes on. There's Mm -hmm. a lot of familial isolation that goes on. If that's not occurring in your family, just open your eyes um, and look around you. I guarantee it's occurring very much within somebody that you know. Right. Um, And so I'm going to put a yes on that one. Right. And some people don't, but there is very much a culture of it. It's almost like I'm not strong enough to be around those people. It's the idea of like, I'm an alcoholic. I'm not going to the bar kind of a thing for me is like, I don't want, I don't want to know bad things about the church. So I'm staying away from those people. Um, Number 17, force individual to rape or to be raped. Uh, Again, I don't (laughs) think, I don't think that that exists. However, the culture of rapid marriage with little to no education could lead to these kinds of problems. That was the thing that I thought of is simply not necessarily that we're encouraged to rape. Um, but if you frankly don't know how to work in a marriage, you're an 18, 19 year old kid. You've never been taught. I'll tell something personal. I didn't know what sex was until (laughs) Sarah told me two weeks before we were going to get married that she was going to be on her period. And I said, what's a period? True story. And I had sisters, so I don't know how that was the case for me, but just the idea that we didn't we didn't talk about these things. My dad had some sort of a conversation with me before 
I said think it was after the this conversation, like something. the night before or something, this is, I understand why they don't want to talk about it, but the, but the ultimate re, um, reality of it is if you're not talking about it, you're perpetrating problems. Yes. And so if a husband and wife don't know how to be intimate, don't know what the other person is going through or, or even what you need or what they need, well, because you're going to, you're going to put yourself in bad situations. Right. Well, because if you're following all of the rules, then you haven't masturbated. You haven't done anything more than holding hands and maybe some kissing Certainly never had sex with somebody else. And then you get married and you're supposed to go from second base to home run, right? Um, And yeah, there's got to, you got to talk about consent and slowing down and yeah, all of that kind of thing. But really what... Well, and there again, you don't have anybody you can go to either. You can't have a bad experience on that first night where some people know that the woman is going to get hurt. I didn't know that. Right. Um... And so didn't my dad talk to you too? Yes. And he, <laughs> I think he did talk to me about the fact that it would probably hurt. Um, but it wasn't an yeah, open all conversation. I is, all I know is that you were terrified to touch me after that. Cause you were like, I don't want to hurt you. And we figured right. it out. Y'all we got, we got the mechanics worked out. We have seven <laughs> children now, but I'm going to say, you know, once again, you have to look into our history because yeah. polygamy in the early days of the church included coercion yeah. and rape yeah. and those types of things. Now, yes, it was a different time period, but even Joseph Smith utilized coercive practices to get very young and already married women to marry him. And yeah. I'm sure older women as well, but the ones that are especially egregious are those teenagers where there was coercion, where there was, you will not go to heaven unless your daughter marries me. Unless you marry me, your eternal salvation is attached to that. So in, in the concept of what we're talking about today, overt behavioral control, maybe this doesn't apply at all, but there's certainly some covert behavioral control going on in this situation. Number 18, instill dependency and obedience. (laughs) Check. Keep going. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like I wrote down a couple of thoughts, but yeah, I don't think we really even need to go into it. And the last one on behavioral control, number 19, encourage and engage in corporal punishment. I think that the culture allows for this in families because the ends justify the means. Like, I don't know that we're taught that, but not anymore. But if you go to Proverbs... If you spare the rod, you, you know, you have bad children, right? Yeah, this idea. And, and so I don't think it is an, um, that's a, that's a misunderstanding of what the scripture means, but for years and years and years, that is how it was taught in many churches, including Mormonism. Sure. Sure. Um, I yeah. believe the rod talks about like more the word of God. So if you spare your children from hearing and receiving the word of God, they're going to be spoiled is I believe right. what it originally meant. Well, but and, we took it to mean beat the shit out of them. Well, and in a lot of ways, who knows what it originally meant? We make it our own. Um, right. But my point being that if you are in an organization where the concept, the ends justify the means you allow for corporal punishment. You might not be teaching it, um, but you allow for it. Because frankly, if, if I as a father, if I read the Book of Mormon that says that the, uh, the sins of the children will be, answered upon the sins of the, uh, will be answered on the heads of the parents to the third and fourth generation, I'm now scared to death. I'm going to get punished because my kids aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. I might allow in my life to do things that I don't necessarily think are the right thing to do because I'm scared that my child is going to walk away from the church and that we're both going to get punished for it rather than having an open conversation. So it, I think that, that is it allows for it. That is one of the reasons my dad took that very I'm seriously. Certain. And that is one of the reasons why my punishment for having sex at 16 before I was married with a non-member boy it is one of the excuses he gave for, or justifications he gave for why he was allowed to treat me so horrifically. Yeah. 
afterwards. Yeah. So whereas if your dad had had the emotional capacity to just sit down with you and say, Hey, what happened? Let's, let's talk about this. Hugs, kisses, blah, blah, blah. He would have accomplished way more right. and would have had a health, maintained a healthy relationship with, with a daughter rather than the overbearing relationship and disconnected relationship that he got. Yeah. So anyway, that's the end of the behavioral control. I did that for all four sections, and we may go through some of that. Yeah, we should probably go through those as we get to those sections. Like today is our last one on overt behavioral control. Um, right. Really, the only other thing that I would add, which we've already talked about, is like that control of time, which is all of these activities, the way you have yeah. to dress at those activities. I mean, it's just there's there's a lot there, but I really feel like we've done a good job covering the behavioral control um side of things and so our next podcast in the bite so the in the bite model we've got behavioral control and then the next one is information control and we're probably only going to spend a couple of episodes one or two on information control because it's just so obvious that I don't think we need to really dig into it in the same way. And so that is going to be what we talk about next week. Mason, did you have anything else you wanted yeah, to add before we sign off? Just a thought on that whole informational control. If there wasn't a problem with informational control, our podcast wouldn't exist. <laughs> Mormonism Live wouldn't exist. Mormon Stories wouldn't exist. But they all exist because of information control. Right. I this don't is think informational is an actual word. You've said that a couple times. So information control. Yes, that so. this is our attempt to break through that. And I think it's really important to say that's also why so many people from that culture are livid with us for yeah. doing this. Yeah. Because what we're doing is considered anti because it's not put out by the church and it talks about the things that the church doesn't want you to know. So next week we will be doing information control. Can't wait to see you there. Thanks so much for joining us Yeah, today. thank you guys. Thanks for being here and thanks for listening. Today's episode was hosted by Sarah and Mason Westbrook, produced by Daisy Girl Communications and Alex Vidalis. We would love to see you on our Unpacking Mormonism and Other Religious Trauma Facebook page. And also, Mason, don't worry. I can't hear the movie that Tyler is blasting in my headphones, so I think we're fine. I can okay. see your brain wondering. Y'all, our, our kiddo um, is in the waiting room blasting a movie, and we're just going to let it happen. Um, <laughs> so... So anyway, many distractions. Right. My my point, maybe yeah, a squirrel. 